might not know this, or maybe some of you do, but it was on this day, January 1st, 1773. That was 250 years ago. A man by the name of John Newton introduced a new song to his congregation. It was actually named with another title at that time, but can't be, but it became known as Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. So 250 years ago in his little congregation there in England, that song was sung for the very first time. Today is the anniversary, 250 years later, of that song on a Sunday in 1773. Many of you know who John Newton was. He was a slave trader. He was a, if you read his biography and about him, he, you actually would get upset at him and mad at him and almost think he needs to go to hell. He deserves to be in hell. He was a bad, bad guy. And yet one day he encountered God's amazing grace. And then he did as much as any one person to change the world at that time against slave trade and set people free. But he wrote this song that has become probably the most beloved song in church history that's probably been sung as much as any other song. So I think we all at least sing the first and the last verse. Can you guys help, help do that? I think we all know it by memory if we sing the first and the last verse. <laughs> Amazing grace. You probably had no idea, right? 250 years ago, Amazing Grace introduced for the first time and has become such a popular song. Now, I've been having a real hard time this morning. I woke up in the night many, many times last night and actually, actually got up really, really early. early. And, uh, and, uh, and then I come to church and all these kids got pajamas on <laughs> and some of these adults. And I've been yawning ever since. So if I yawn in the middle of my message, it's not because I'm bored with what I'm saying, okay? It's uh, lack of sleep and also these pajamas that are kind of like putting it on me that way. All right, all right, y'all need to go, okay? So maybe it'll help me if I don't see you in those pajamas. Okay. <laughs> now, my wife is, is old-fashioned, as you know. All right, I mean, really old-fashioned. And uh, she insists on I wear a tie and, and, and suit, even though this is the day that pastors are wearing jeans and shirts that are hanging out, and you've watched the pastors on TV and such. And so she actually this morning told me, she said, somebody posted on your Facebook, if you can dress up to preach to a dead corpse at a funeral, can't you dress up to preach to the living on a Sunday morning? Did you hear that? If, if the preacher can pre dress up to preach, because always at funerals, the pastors have on shirt and ties and a suit. 
I mean, they all do. The ones I know them, they wear the pants and the, all that. And I think I'd be more comfortable wearing that too, but my wife won't let me. But, uh, and I'm, I'm somewhat henpecked, but that's okay. Uh, I've got a good hen pecking on me, and, and I like that, and I'm willing to. So, but anyway, so if we can dress up to preach at a funeral, we can dress up to a dead corpse. We can preach up to dress, up for, to preach to the living on Sunday morning. So anyway, so I'm dressed up today for the first day of the year, and my wife's watching by live stream. <laughs> so, so I have to give an account to. Actually, first thing I told her, I was wearing jeans and a, and a shirt hanging out this morning, but uh, that didn't go over too good. <laughs> also, you can pray for Edith. Uh, of course, uh, she's there with a the baby, little baby Luke, who had to go back to the hospital and. Actually, they told her a couple of nights ago the lung had collapsed, and and then this morning or last night or this morning we were told the baby's doing a lot better. So, little Praise Luke, God. we appreciate your prayers, and so so she's been there with with Kimberly and the baby a lot since since Thursday. Uh, then yesterday morning, one of her first cousins uh, died very suddenly. They're all they're all she and another cousin. There's three of them that were very very close. So as Beverly and Catherine and uh, Edith grew up together and just really, really close. And Beverly uh, very suddenly died, had some surgery because she had broken a femur in her leg. And then uh, some complications took place later in the week. And, uh, and, she, and she passed away yesterday morning early. So I know Edith would appreciate your prayers for that too. And we'll be no doubt going back to that service probably later this week. They're in Appomattox, Virginia is where she's from. So also to remind you, first day of the year, okay? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a broken record. I'm a broken record. And that record is read your Bible, okay? Pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. Neglect your Bible and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. Anybody remember that song? Okay. I, I'm not going to try to sing it to you. But if you'll read your Bible, and I just, if you want to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, like we talked about in Sunday school, it is absolutely necessary for you to read, listen, you can listen to the Word of God today. The Bible is app, the YouVersion app, they're, they're so good. So on the way here, I listen to the Bible all the way, all the way from Sneeds Ferry to here this morning. And on my way home, I'll be listening to the Bible all the way back. When I'm by myself in the car, I'm not going to listen to anything else, basically, and never do except the Bible. And I'm not going to have a radio tell me what I'm going to listen to. Uh, I'm going to listen to God's Word that I choose to listen to. And so uh, today's the first day of a new year. So I encourage you, get a schedule. And if you read your Bible all the way through, and if you don't do it in one year and you actually take two years to do it, you'll have read through your entire Bible more than most 90, I bet you 95% of people that call themselves Christians. Because I have found people do not read their Bible like they should. And there's a ignorance of God's word today. And because of that, and people lack knowledge is the reason our families, our churches, and I'm convinced our country is in such great need. Years ago, I was asked to be a part of a debate, and this is when it was really going around on prayer in school and Bible reading in school. And they had uh, this debate, they had judges and all these people, and I was the person representing we should have Bible reading and prayer in the public schools. And, and I shocked them. I shocked them. Because when they told me I could speak, I said, well, to be honest with you, I'm not sure we should be reading our Bibles in our public schools if we're not reading them at home. Why should we read them in our public schools when you're not reading them at home? And they looked at me like, okay, you're supposed to be saying we're supposed to read the Bible in our schools. But the truth is the reason we're not reading them in our public schools is we quit reading them at home. We quit reading them on our own time. And, and so I just encourage you, the one book that is the book above every book in this world is the Word of God. God's inspired holy word that he has miraculously given us. And people, people died. I wish we could talk about Fox's Book of Martyrs. People died, died, died to translate this Bible into our English language. And they died in torturous, terrible, awful ways. 
to put this Bible in the English language. And then many of us have copy after copy after copy laying around our homes. And we dare, we don't take time to just open it and read it and ingest it and meditate on it. And uh, a couple of my favorite verses in Psalm chapter 1, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Man, what a promise. Amen. God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. In the very next verse, he says, be strong and of good courage for I'm with you. But I'm telling you, if you're not in the word of God on a regular basis, you will not know the presence of God in your life like you should either. And that is just paramount. All right, I've already preached to you enough. I should say, amen, let's go home. So we do have a Bible reading schedule back on the back table in the lobby there. And there's two of them. One is takes about 20 minutes a day. The other maybe 10 to 15 minutes a day. And uh, both of them will get you to the Bible. The longer 20 minutes, 25 minutes a day will get you through the Old Testament once, the New Testament twice, Proverbs every month, and the Book of Psalms twice. So they're back in the back, and we just really encourage you, please, 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 listening by live stream, you're here today, just somehow or another, take that daily time of devotion with God. Take that time of devotion with God. And if you read something, it's better than not reading anything anytime. So God bless you as you take time to fill your heart with God's truth and God's word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so may the Lord help us to do that. All right. Well, our our theme verse, I think it'll be on the screen here. Our theme verse for the year, there it is. So let's stand up. I say for the year, for this Bible series that we're doing on the names of God is Psalm 910. So let's say it out loud together if you would. Rodney, don't try to stand. Rodney, Rodney, you don't need to stand. You're good, buddy. Matter of fact, when I saw you sitting on the front row and you and Donna sitting on the front row and you're normally back in the back row back there, I thought, goodness sakes, are we having revival at Friendly Community Church? <laughs> I didn't know you were singing this morning. <laughs> you get all the blessings before they trickle back. Well, before they triple back. God bless you, Donna. All right, so let's say this Bible verse together, amen? All right, together. Psalm 910, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Now, Father, I pray in these next moments today as we uh, go back to a name that we studied a couple weeks ago, several weeks ago, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals you. And we think about how the world is full of bitterness and hurt and and separation uh, from friends and relatives and loved ones because of bitterness and, and, and broken relationships. We pray, God, today that you would use uh, the thoughts that you've put on my heart for today to help us understand how we've got to forgive one another. We've got to deal with that bitterness or it will, it will zap us of our pursuit of God and seeking you with all of our heart. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts and our lives today, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated. You can be seated. And I'm going to look back at Exodus chapter 5. I'm going to, 15. I'm going to read several of the texts we read before about Moses and uh, here at this this water called Mara, which means bitter, and the people could not drink it. And what we did in that message several weeks ago, we met God. Okay, and got to know God by this name. But today what we're going to try to do is learn how we can experience God by this name. Because I'm convinced the healing that God really wants us to have has to do with our souls more than has to do with our bodies. Now, God does care about our bodies. I'm sure of that. Jesus came and he healed sick people. He gave sight to blind people. 
He physically helped people. Jesus did. He fed hungry people. Jesus cares about our bodies, no doubt about it. But far more than he cares about our bodies, he says in the passage in the New Testament, he said, hey, don't fear them that kill the body. And after that, they have no more that they can do. But I'll forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him who hath power to cast both soul and body into hell. And what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's nothing more valuable than your soul. And I'm afraid many of our souls are sick with this disease called bitterness. Bitterness is a cancer of the soul. And it's more devastating and dangerous than any physical cancer that any person can have or sickness that we can have. And we're going to see that, I believe, this morning in this message. And so we're going to pray and ask God as we go through this message and believe that as, as, as you hear what we're talking about, as you take God's word, begin to apply it to your heart and your mind, maybe you'll take this message from the live stream and have some friends and relatives and others listen to it and say, this is what we need. We've got to be healed. We've got to get over this. We've got to get past this. And there's only one way this healing takes place, and we'll see it in God's word. Amen? Are you with me still? You haven't gone to sleep yet? All right. Now, I understand usually the more I speak, the more awake I become. So by the end of this message, I'll be pretty fired up possibly. So in Exodus 15, 22 through 27, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness. They found no water, and when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Remember Naomi? Remember Naomi, the book of Ruth? Remember Naomi went to, uh, down to Moab with her husband, Elimelech, and her two sons, Malon and Chilion. Remember that? Because there was no bread, there was a famine in Bethlehem, and there was no bread. So they went over to enemy territory. They went over to the Moabites. And there her two sons married two Moabite women. And there her husband, Elimelech, died. There Shilion died and Malon died. And all she had left was Orpha and Ruth. And when she went back to Bethlehem, because she heard there was bread back in Bethlehem, she told him, don't call me Naomi anymore, but call me, remember what she said? Call me Mara. For God hath dealt bitterly with me. She lost her son. She lost her son. She lost her husband. But my friend, I, I wish I had time just to preach on that. But God gave her a Ruth. Amen. And one of the most beautiful stories in all the Bible and to whom the seed of Jesus Christ comes is this lady named Ruth. And now that bitterness comes to Ruth that brings the life of God back into the hearts of his people and brings us Jesus today. Amen? Amen? What a thought. And so the water was bitter. It's called Mara, which means bitter. And the people complained against Moses and saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statute and an ordinance to them. And there he tested them and said, and God speaking, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I'll put none of these diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah who heals you. And that's Jehovah Rapha. That's where we met him by that name. I am the Lord who heals you. I turn the bitter into something that can become sweet and beneficial and helpful and life-giving in your life. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. That's our Old Testament passage. Now, for a New Testament passage that we'll really be going back to again and again and again. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. 
the writer of Hebrews says, pursue peace with the people you like. Oh, no, it didn't say that. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. Now, listen, what it says next. Without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, think about it. If you're not pursuing peace and holiness, you won't have a relationship with the Lord like you should. You can't see him. You won't sense him. In other words, his presence will not be at work in your life. And you will have a miserable year in 2023. I don't think you want that. So he says, pursue peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then verse 15 tells you how to do it. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now I'm convinced no matter what we face in life, no matter what we deal with in life, no matter what tragedy, heartbreak, grief, offense, abuse, whatever it is comes our way, God has promised to give us grace to deal with it. We can receive that grace or we can say, no, I don't want it. And we can go on to be bitter, bitter people. And notice what he says. If you fall short of that grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many are defiled. I think I have some other verses. Let me find them here. Is the next verse up there? Exodus, let's see. I'm not sure what I put on the screen. Let's go to the next, yeah, okay. Exodus 1.14, the people of Israel and Egypt and Pharaoh, he made, the Egyptians made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field and all their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. He made their lives bitter. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. If there's one thing he'd like to do is make your life bitter. Have you ever met a bitter person? You can see it in their eyes. You can sense it in their presence. You don't even have to get real close to them. You can feel it. And I'm telling you, the world is full of bitter people. And the sad thing is the church is full of bitter people. And they're defiling the whole body of Christ and hindering the work of God in his church. <laughs> I, know, I, mean, I know you're thinking, come on, pastor, I came to church the first Sunday of the year to be encouraged. All you're doing is stepping on my toes. Genesis 26, 35. And they made their life bitter for Isaac and Jacob. And I can't tell the story behind all these verses because there is a story there. <laughs> that was the wives of uh, Esau. Uh, <laughs> The wives that they didn't like, remember? No, wish I no. Anyway, Esau married these Canaanite women. They connected up with the world, and those women, those daughter-in-laws, <laughs> made their lives bitter. Isaac and Jacob, Isaac and Rebecca. Oh goodness. Okay, Numbers five twenty-four, and and this is another whole story. If a woman was accused of committing adultery, the husband could take her to the priest, and the priest would make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings the curse. And the water that brings the curse shall enter into her and cause bitter pain. And I want to tell you, sin always brings bitterness into our lives. Deuteronomy 29:18. Beware lest there be among you a man or a woman or a clan or tribe whose heart is turning away from the Lord Jehovah our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. 
So God's warning Israel through Moses just before they go in the Holy Land, just before they cross the Jordan River, beware lest there be any of your tribes, your clans or families or individuals that stray and start going after the gods of the Canaanites. Start going after the gods of America today that are not the true gods. Beware of them because these people will bring the root of bitterness into your midst and it's poisonous. Then I already talked about root. Uh, let me go to the next one. Psalm 106. <laughs> Moses, the meekest man that ever lived, but he lost his ticket to the Holy Land. I'll be standing on Mount Nebo in a few months here. And that's the place Moses got to see the Holy Land, but he was not allowed to go over there. You know why? He got mad. <laughs> and he hit a rock instead of speaking to it like God told him to. He's disobedient. And he lost his ticket to the Holy Land. And it tells us in Psalm 106, 33, for they made his spirit bitter and he spoke rashly with his lips. Good people do bad things when they get bitter and causes even themselves great hurt. And then Job, Job went through a pretty tough time and he says, as God lives, who has taken away my right and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter. And then one last verse, Colossians 3, 19. And this has always been a verse that I thought, wow, that is an interesting verse. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. What? I thought we married them because we love them and we want to encourage them and help them. Why does he have to tell us not to be bitter against our wives? Well, all you have to do is be married for a little while. <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that. All right. Now, are you still with me? Okay, and I got 10 minutes left to preach this whole message. Now, remember, we're talking about Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. But before we talked about Jehovah Rapha, we talked about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. The Lord is our healer. But there are times in life when things happen to us that we resent, and oftentimes we react by venting our feelings in destructive ways. There are times when our reaction gets us into trouble. If that ever happened to you, it sure has happened to me. Other people, even innocent people, get hurt as a result of our own bitterness. And so the writer of Hebrews is telling us that this one thing that gets us into trouble is bitterness. Bitterness will trouble the one who is bitter and pollute and contaminate those closest to us. So many people today are living with bitterness. And so we're going to be seeing about how we can handle bitterness rather than allowing bitterness to handle us. Uh, and I wrote, just hand wrote this in my notes as I was going through this one more time this morning. Uh, there's nothing more important in, in 2023 for me, for you, for any believer, anybody, nothing more important than enjoying the presence and the blessings of God. Do you think about it? I mean, can money buy you happiness? Can things buy you happiness? Temporarily, yeah, maybe. And people, relationships, we get codependent thinking this person will make me happy. <laughs> I've, I've done a lot of marriages where these couples are so in love they can't stand it. And it's not a year, two years later, they hate each other's guts and get divorced. What happened? What they thought would make them happy made them miserable. No, no, no. Here's where you find where we can have that peace and joy and, and, and love that God wants us and satisfaction, the blessings and the presence of God without Pursuing peace and holiness, we cannot see the Lord. That's what it says. 
So first we want to divide, define the presence of bitterness. So verse 15, looking carefully, which means inspect carefully, diligently, lest any root of bitterness spring up causes trouble. So how should we direct our attention to this? Well, first we see bitterness explained. The English word bitterness, listen real careful, comes from an O root word meaning to bite, to bite. Bitterness is like being bitten by the old serpent, Satan, and he releases his venom and poison into our hearts and into our lives. I thought it was interesting in Acts 8, 23, Peter said to Simon, for I see that you're poisoned by bitterness and you're bound by iniquity. And boy, there's a lot of folk like that. So bitterness is the poison that comes when bitten by certain things in life. T.S. Rendell defines bitterness as the atmosphere produced in us internally when we meditate over life circumstances and we decide we've not been given a fair deal. Someone defined bitterness as the radioactive fallout that contaminates everything in life after there's been a failure in the core of our being to come to grip with life's disappointments. I love Adrian Rogers, the great preacher of yesteryear. He said, bitterness is a blight, an emotional cancer, which consumes many a person who once had the bloom of eternal springtime upon him. Bitterness is that feeling of hurt, resentment, anger, hate, and even revenge. It often builds up in our hearts when we've been bitten by certain experiences in life. James Merritt said, bitterness is harbored hurt hidden in the heart. And choosing to be consumed with bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. I, I knew a gentleman, and some of his family might even be listening to this live stream, but this goes back like 45 years ago. And uh, his family, his wife got saved, his daughters got saved, came to church, got baptized. And I tried to talk with him, but he was bitter. He was bitter because he had a piece of property up in West Virginia, and he was up on his property one day hunting, and some hunters came on his property, told him to get off of it. And instead of getting off of it, they literally beat him and left him for dead. He got so bitter about that that he only lived for one thing. He was going to get even with those guys. He was going to kill them. He was going up to that property, making a stand, and he was going to let the police kill him, and he was going to die. He ended up shooting some people. And I'm telling you, I knew this man. He, he, I actually made friends with him. Being a friend didn't change his bitterness with me. It's a sad world to be in when you're consumed with bitterness. Bitterness is expressed both horizontally, manward, and it's expressed Godward. You get bitter toward a boss that fired you, a spouse that walked out on you, a business partner that cheated you out of money, Headline news yesterday was two business partners shot each other and killed each other over something that happened in their auto business. That was headline news yesterday. A friend that violated your trust. I got so many stories that just flood through my mind of watching these things happen. A father who abused you, a mother who mistreated you, a brother or sister who let you down, a church in which you got hurt. Visited the old gentleman dying in the hospital with cancer years ago, John Fletcher. And somebody asked me to visit him because he hated churches and he hated people. And I thought, well, then I'm the last person to visit this dude. But I went in there anyway. And he told me, yes, when I was a kid, such and such happened with his pastor and with his church. And I'll never, ever go back to a church again. 
You know, by the grace of God, before that week was over, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ, and his life was totally changed. One of the most miraculous stories I've ever been a part of. A church in which you got hurt, or a preacher, you're bitter because a preacher didn't see you or call you. And I hear it all the time. So bitterness can be expressed Godward. I'll never forget, I was a young pastor, just started pastoring. And we were in a UAW building, still at that time in this very first days of this church. And this lady and her daughter were coming to church, and her son would come sometimes. He was a senior in high school. Then we got the phone call in October, on a cold, rainy night, that he was speeding there in the highway near the high school, ran off the road and hit something, and he was killed in that accident. And so I went to the house the next morning to see the mother. And this mother at church, she was a very kind and gracious lady. But when I went into that house that day, I'll never forget it. I had a deacon, Mr. Go with me, Henry Go, and we stood there, and this lady attacked me. She attacked me. And she's screaming, why did God do this? Why did God do this? Why did God do this? And she's coming at me. And I'm going, oh, oh I, I mean, I'm just a brand new pastor, man. I did, they didn't teach me how to handle this stuff in seminary and college. And I'm just saying, well, man, I, I flipped. And there's more to that story, I can tell you. But I, I, she, she f- took it out on me because I represented God. And it was God she was angry at. And I want to tell you, all bitterness really, really is angry, is anger at God. It really is. Because if God is good and God is in charge of all things, then why did God allow this to happen to me? Even though that bitterness might be vented horizontally or or vertically. Well, that's the presence of bitterness. How about the pollution of bitterness? He says it springs up and causes trouble and many are defiled. Now think about this. He, he calls it the root of bitterness. Now before something can take root, it has to be planted. Okay? So now we've already talked about how bitterness gets planted. Something bad happens to you, right? So it gets planted. Are you, are, you got to follow this. If you're going to deal with bitter, so, so you, you can't help. Well, we'll get to that in a second, okay? But, 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 but it has to be planted, and it happens through circumstances, people, things that happen. But for a root to grow, it has to be cultivated. There must be soil for it to grow in, and there has to be the water and sun to nourish it. Now, the writer speaking here of the root of bitterness springing up. And the idea is that we're allowing bitterness to grow and develop in our lives. Now, listen careful. I can't control what happens to me, but I can control what happens in me. I can't control how I act. I can't control how others act toward me, but I can control how I react to them. So what happens is that we provide the soil, the water, and sun for bitterness to be cultivated in our life. Instead of dealing with the feelings of bitterness when they first sprout, we cultivate them and we allow them to develop. We just relive what hurt us. We rethink it. We go over it and over it and over it. And it just, it's with us when we wake up. It's with us when we go to bed. It's with us when we're going down the road. It's with us with trigger things that happen and we see it and we just feel it. And it gets worse and worse and worse, and it ultimately destroys our soul. The writer tells us that when we allow bitterness to develop, spring up, that it troubles us. Springing up, germinates, grow, spring up. The word trouble here means to crowd within, to annoy. The word sometimes is translated vex. And the idea is that it pushes out the good things in our heart, and it takes over in our life. And bitterness will crowd out our joy, our happiness, our contentment, our peace, and it will fill us instead with anger and hurt and resentment and hatred. Amen? That's what happens. There's so many more notes here. 
Defiled. It says it defiles. That means to sully, to taint, to contaminate. It pollutes. Someone said, Stanley Jones said, a rattlesnake, and I didn't know this. I don't even know if it's true, but he said it. A rattlesnake, if cornered, will sometimes become so angry that it'll bite itself. And that's exactly what the harboring of hate and resentment against other is. It's a bite, biting. Remember, it's a bite, but it's a biting of oneself. We think we're harming others and holding these spites and hates, but the deeper harm is to ourselves. It poisons us. Bitterness is a plant that takes over in our life. It troubles the bitter one. Bitterness defiles the bitter one. When we're filled with bitterness, we're only hurting ourselves and those around us. A bitter heart is shooting arrows that eventually will come back to harm and hurt the one who shot them. Now, we got to take a few minutes on this, and that is how do we defeat the power of bitterness? Because it's a powerful thing, and it can destroy. Remember that Jesus said, the thief has come to what? In John 10.10, 10, to steal to kill and destroy. He's the one that wants you to be bitter. God wants you to be better. <laughs> and what the devil means for evil, you know one of the best examples of this in the whole Bible? I mean, there's a lot of good examples. The best example is Jesus. But one of the better, good examples, you know who it is? Can, can, it's in the book of Genesis in the very last chapter. Remember what happened there? Remember the story of Joseph? Remember his brothers? Remember what they did to him? They threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. They made fun of him. They mocked him. They sold him into slavery. If anybody could have been bitter, it could have been Joseph. And when dad died, they were scared to death that he's going to get even because he's, he's the head dude of Egypt under Pharaoh. But what did he say? Remember what he said in Genesis 50? He said, you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And it's one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. Amen. Oh, I wish we could stop there, but let me, let me go on, okay, just for a few minutes here. Can you give me a couple more minutes? Yeah. Bitterness can be defeated and overcome in our life. It can be. And instead of being handled by bitterness, we need to learn how to handle bitterness. So how do we do it? How do you get rid of a root? How do you get rid of a root? Yeah, you pull it up. You get a shovel. Now, some roots that have kind of like spread, 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 spread. Now, this is a whole lot different than where I was in Virginia, okay? Because in Virginia, the ground's hard and rocky. And when the roots got into that ground and started getting deeper and deeper to get you know, like here, it's just like you just pull it up and there's sand and stuff, it just comes up. But not in Virginia. Man, you have to work and work and work and get picks and shovels and everything else to dig up all the roots or they're going to come back up. <sighs> Dealing with bitterness may not be easy because some things have to be done that go against our human nature. Now, l listen to this verse. Ephesians 4.31, 4.31, we got to put away whatever injures us, put away. We talked about this in Sunday school the other day. Let all bitterness, is this on the screen there? Let all bitterness, no, no, let some bitterness, let, let a little bit of, not, not all of it, because there's some people I just can't, I can never forgive. No, no, it says let all bitterness. Wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking put, a, put away from you with all malice. Now, that word put away actually means to dispose of. It literally means to throw in the garbage can. We're to look at whatever injures us, put it in the right perspective, see what it really is. It's trash that needs to be disposed of in our life. I read this illustration. I was going to skip it, but in the end of the Civil War, and this is in the book Lee, The Last Years by Charles Flood, talking about how after the war, Robert E. Lee had visited a lady who took him to the remains of a grand old tree in front of her house. 
This tree had been like a family heirloom. heirloom. And she was crying to the, as she pointed out the limbs that had been destroyed by the federal, the federal artillery fire and the trunk had been defaced by the Union Army. And she looked at Lee, General Lee, and asked, what, what should she do about it? After a moment of silence, Lee said, cut it down, my dear madam, and forget it. <laughs> cut it down and forget it. Whatever it is that has injured you and left you full of bitterness, it says, put it away. Throw it away, cut it down, and forget it. Now, honestly, I know that you can't forget, okay? But when you remember, remember, remember it, you have to remember the grace of God that he gives you to deal with it. Now, if you receive the grace of God to deal with it, when it comes back, oh, okay. We get hurt emotionally. I mean, if somebody stabs us with a knife or cut ourselves with a knife, it, it leaves, a, it leaves a, a wound, and, and we can do one of two things with that cut. We can put dirt on it and not take care of it, but, but it can get infected. And, and if it gets infected, we might end up having to cut off our hand. If we let it really get infected, it might go up in our, it might take our lives. Okay, just a little cut. You can do one of the things with a cut. You can put the right medicine on it. You can put the right medicine on it. And you can put the right medicine on it. You can take care of it. And eventually, it gets a scab. Now, if you're not careful, you want to pick at the scab. And that's the worst thing to do because you can get it reinfected. But if you let it finally heal by doing the right thing, it becomes a scar. And that scar doesn't hurt anymore. And it becomes a reminder, don't do stupid thing with, and I'm not going to tell you the stupid things I've done with knives and other things to cut myself, but every time I see this great big scar down the middle of my arm, I'll never forget trying to kill a bumble, I mean a, a hornet that was on my arm with a razor knife. <laughs> Why in the world would somebody be so stupid to do that? And I slit my arm all the way open, almost down to the bone with a razor knife, trying to knock a hornet off of it. That was dumb. That was stupid. I'm, you probably don't want me to be your pastor here anymore. <laughs> One person said, Pastor, I'm sure glad that bee didn't land on your throat. <laughs> I said, I am too. No, 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 no. So what do you do with bitterness? You put the right medicine on it. You say, I can't forgive because you do not know what so-and-so did to me. And the answer to that is, has anyone ever treated you like they did Jesus? Jehovah Rapha, he's the Lord. By his stripes, we are healed. You know what you do when that hurt is relived in your mind or in your heart or the person who offended you, abused you, whatever they did, you go to the cross of Jesus Christ. He cut a tree down. Remember the tree? The tree is the cross of Christ, the suffering of Christ, the passion of Christ. And you remember it's through his passion that he forgave you. The Bible says, our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You do not deserve to be forgiven by God. We spit in his face. We blasphemed his name, and he forgave us. And if he forgave us, we, for Christ's sake, forgive one another. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. When Jesus was dying, can you imagine? I always picture this when I read the suffering of Christ and these people are taking their, they blindfold him, they take their fist and they hit him and they take their rod and they smash him in the face till his face is not even the face of a human being. And they're mocking him at the same time. Who hit you if you're the son of God? And here is Jesus who spoke the world into existence. Their very breath that they're breathing is he is giving it to them as they do that. He could have called 10,000 legions of angels 
and wiped them all out. But what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, if he could do that for our sake to save us, we go to the cross. Does it mean you feel better immediately? No, no, no. When I get that cut and I put iodine, do they do iodine anymore? Remember when we were kids? It was that old red iodine. And boy, did it burn. And you put it on there and the initial medicine hurt. It was not good, but you cleaned out the wound. You dealt with the infection and the pain, and you did it, and you did it, and you did it, and it took the right medicine, and it took time, but if you keep doing it, it heals. Now, I'm almost done. Peter said, how many times should I forgive my brother that offends me? He, and he thought he's doing pretty good if he did it maybe seven times or so, you know? And Jesus said, no, no, no. Forgive him how many times? 70 times 7. Now, what, what is that if you do math? Who does math? 490. 490. Okay. So, Bob, you hurt me, okay? Okay. <laughs> One. You hurt me again. Two. Now, but, but here's the problem. Bob might not hurt me the second or third or fourth time, but he hurt me the first time. But what I do is I relive it and relive it and relive it. So what I do every time I relive it, I forgive. And 490 times, you think I'd lose count by the time I got to 100? I think so. And so you know what he's teaching? Every time you remember and you feel the pain, you put the right medicine on. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that God gave me. And I forgive them. I, I can tell you, I've been, I've been deeply, deeply hurt by some of my best friends. I mean, so bad that I went into a deep depression, and it hurt. And it wasn't easy to forgive when somebody betrays you and hurts you and stabs you in the back. And it's, it'd be easier to deal with a physical wound, and it goes deep. But I can tell you, if you put the right medicine on it and you let the Lord use it in your life, you can say like Joseph, yes, the devil meant it for evil in my life, but God meant it for good. And I have a new experience of Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals me of all my diseases. Oh, Matthew, I mean, Micah 5, 17, 5, 19. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities and you cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Psalms 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen? That's how much God forgave us. So today, what's, what's, what's eating at you? Is there bitterness of hurt or pain from some person or family member or somebody in the past in your life or somebody at church? Whatever it is, a neighbor, you will never be effective for God with a bitter spirit. I mean, really effective for God. Proverbs 18, 14 is a powerful verse. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? And a broken spirit is a bitter spirit. So realize what bitterness is doing to you. How is it affecting the others in your life? And ask God to help you. Cut down the tree, okay? Cut down the tree. Dispose of the source of the bitterness. Forgive the offender, even if they don't ask for it. They don't have to ask for it. In your heart, forgive them. That don't mean you have to jump in the car and run around the block with them and get on a plane and fly around the world with them. It don't mean you have to do that. But it means in your heart you have to forgive them. Some people don't want to be forgiven. They want the fight to continue. That's just the way they are. But you forgive them anyway in your heart. And then show them acts of kindness that they don't deserve. Be kind to them. Send them a card. Give them a gift. Cut the grass. What? What are you doing? Get out of my yard. I'm just, can I, can I do anything else to help around here? <laughs> Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. I love 
being nice to people that are mad at me. That's just some fun about that. Oh, and you know what happens? You experience the peace and the joy and the presence and the blessings of God in your life. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us of all our bitterness, of all our disease. And the bitter water became sweet. And God's people say, amen. amen. Is, it, is it dark outside yet? It might be somewhere. It's okay. All right, let's pray. Father, I don't know what you're doing in everyone's heart, but I know I need this message. I know people listening to live stream need this message. I know people here today, we all need this message. We have to be reminded if we're going to see the Lord, if we're going to see the Lord, we got to pursue peace and holiness. And that's peace with all people. That means we've got to pursue forgiveness and kindness and joy. And Lord, we can't do it though unless we receive your grace. When somebody hurts me, I want to hurt them back. That's just human. But then to reach up and to the reservoir of God's love and God's grace and God's mercy and to take his love and his grace and his mercy and just to pass it on. It's not me doing it. It's really God in me doing that because I feel just the opposite. I'm hurt. I want to get even. I'm mad. But I reach up to your grace and your love and your mercy that I found at the cross. And I just pass it on. It's amazing what happens when we do that. I know I need it this year. I don't have any idea what we'll face in the days and months and the years ahead as things are going in this country. But Lord, our reaction as believers should not be to become angry people, but we ought to become better people and happy people, blessed people because we're pursuing peace and holiness. Peace with all men, holiness with God, set apart, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to do that diligently every day. Is God speaking to your heart today? What do you need to take care of in your life? Is a root of bitterness already gotten kind of deep down into your soul? Would you even today just say, God, please, please help me. Help me. I don't want to be a bitter person. And I'm telling you, if you're bitter, you defile your family, you defile your children, you defile everybody you work around. I think they get that defilement comes off on them. Many are defiled. So Lord, help us, I pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amen. Well, God bless you. And uh, if you leave mad at me, I still love you. <laughs> amen. God bless you.